Hello folks, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI-121. This is the fall of Atlantis, the Thera eruption, 1500 BCE. So these are questions I would actually have asked the class had we been meeting in the classroom face to face. And I'd like you just to keep them in mind uh, here at the beginning uh, so that you, you have them at the back of your mind at least while you're listening to the lecture. So what can ancient myth tell us about the reality of ancient history? And actually, is this a question that we should be asking in the first place? Uh, what are some of the potential risks of using mythology as a source? And yeah, this is me basically saying that there are some ways in which using myth as a source can go very badly off track. And uh, we will kind of reach that spot by the end of this lecture, or at least by the Zoom session where we're talking about it. All right, on to the eruption itself. So we are talking about the eruption of the Thera or Santorini volcano, sometimes called the Minoan eruption. It is an important marker for Bronze Age, Ar Bronze Age archaeology and is traditionally dated to 1500 BCE. But note the C, 1500 BCE, in the title of the lecture. Um, dating is a bit of an issue here, as we will get into. So why is it so important? Um, there are many reasons. But in general, natural disasters leave specific types of physical evidence that can then be used as dating tools. So the layer of volcanic pumice can be used to date both what comes before it and what comes after it. To do this, however, you need the proper date. And there has been some debate, as I said, over Thera. Now, over time, better methods of dating were applied. So we see the uh, appearance of radiocarbon dating, uh, dendrochronology, that's the uh, use of tree rings, and uh, ice cores. So the scientific dating seems to support a date that's over 100 years prior to the traditional date. So what is causing the confusion? Well, Thera wasn't the only volcano that erupted around that time. There is an Alaskan volcano, an Iakchuk, that can be dated to the 17th century BCE. Now, both the volcanic glass layer and the ice cores and the tree ring evidence could very well be reflecting that rather than Thera. So actually the waters are a bit muddied here, date-wise. You might wonder why it's so important to settle on a date, because it comes back to the use of uh, natural phenomenon to construct chronology. The dating of the eruption of Thera has enormous implications for the Egyptian chronology, specifically the dates for Egypt's second intermediate period and the beginning of the 18th dynasty. Now, Egyptian chronology is the basis for most other chronologies in the Mediterranean. And this is why people are so determined to figure this out. But because there are competing dates, we now have competing chronologies. Now, remember there are two different types of dating that we're dealing with here. There's relative dating and there's absolute dating. Now, with relative dating, we can put the eruption easily following the subdivision of the late Minoan period, which we will talk about shortly, because we have the eruption layer in excavations. Now, giving it an absolute date is another matter entirely. Now, I'm going to give you a sense of the challenges by just running quickly through some different dates and their sources. Do not write down these numbers. They are not individually important. It is the pattern that I want you to see. So the pattern is that, generally speaking, possible dates range from the 17th to the 16th century BCE. And there's a lot of conflicting information. So for instance, uh, archaeologists found seeds in sealed jars buried by the eruption. They have been radiocarbon dated to somewhere between 1660 and 1613 uh, at about a 95% confidence level. The most likely range is 1639 to 1616. But an olive branch found in the volcanic deposits was also radiocarbon dated, and its growth rings were analyzed. It was dated to 1627 to 1600 BCE. But it's a burned branch, thousands of years old. If the counting of the rings is out by even 25%, it could be a completely different date range, something well into the 16th century. Now, shrubs buried in the eruptions gave radiocarbon dates from 1675 to 1522. Uh, ice cores show acid spikes at 1622, 1618, 
Uh, but even those readings are plus or minus several years. Now, the other thing about the ice core evidence is that the acid concentration is a bit questionable. It suggests 6 to 12 times the volcanic fallout uh, than what the Minoan eruption would actually have produced, which suggests another volcano, whether it's Antioch, Chuck, or something else. So I'm hoping you're getting some sense of how uncertain things can be trying to match up these forms of data. Just because it's scientific dating doesn't mean it settles anything. It has to be interpreted and there are no single right answers. All right, let's talk about the eruption itself. So Thera or Santorini is what we call the subduction volcano, a subduction zone volcano rather. Uh, this is where the, in this case, it's where the African tectonic plate moves beneath the Eurasian plate. As it continues to descend, it releases water into the mantle, which lowers its melting temperature. Uh, the magma rises up and gets concentrated in magma chambers. If anything increases the pressure, boom, you've got an eruption. The Minoan eruption is the second largest in the past four millennia and the largest eruption in Europe since the Ice Age. It ejected 60 cubic kilometers of rock into the ocean and atmosphere to the height of over 35 kilometers. This is into the stratosphere. Now, the island was partially destroyed. You can see it uh, in the image there. What you've got left is essentially just the rim of the caldera. This was a big, big eruption. Uh, Mount Tambora, which erupted in 1815, uh, produced the famous uh, year without a summer in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have uh, sort of a similar, um, but similar size. So we have some sense of just how dramatic the effects of the eruption could have been. Now, we believe that the eruption would likely have been preceded by earthquakes and ashfall uh, for weeks, maybe even months beforehand. This appears to have caused the inhabitants to flee because we don't have evidence of deaths like we had at Pompeii. Uh, there would also have been multiple phases to the eruption that would have started with ash, moved on to rock fragments. Uh, the first stage of a full volcanic eruption is called the Plinian uh, column, sorry, that should be column, not eruption, by modern scholars, because Pliny at uh, Pompeii had observed the column of ash and rock uh, coming up from Vesuvius. Now, after this, you would likely have seen erupting vents in the sea and uh, violent explosions where magma and seawater interacted. And then as the um, eruption continued, pyroclastic flows, gas and rock fragments, massive tsunamis could have been up to 40 meters in height, and uh, heavier ash and rock deposits uh, would have continued until the fourth stage where we see the collapse of the caldera. And the best guess of volcanologists is that the eruption would have lasted about four days in total. All right, so how does this all connect to the Minoan civilization? A little bit of background here. Uh, pumice quarrying uh, turned up evidence of a buried civilization on Theresia, uh, which is the eastern part uh, of the island in 1867. And the geologist involved published an account of what he thought the eruption would have been like from a ge geological standpoint. So we get a lot of public interest. Uh, we see Akrotiri discovered not long after that. It's a Minoan civilization city buried by the eruption. Uh, its systematic excavation doesn't begin for almost a century, however. Uh, why do you think uh, 1967 would have been a big year for um, digging up uh, buried Mediterranean cities? It's mostly because uh, the explorations at the time uh, for oil and gas in uh, the Aegean and the Mediterranean turned up an ash layer in the deep sea settlement, which rekindled people's interest in the eruption. Now, Akrotiri is a spectacular site. Uh, its buildings are preserved very well. Uh, some of them are several stories in height. Um, it has a huge number of artifacts and rooms full of wall paintings, but no human bones. So we were assuming that they have been warned off by the initial stages of the eruption. Uh, Spiridon Marionotis was the original archaeologist. He was the one who'd also hypothesized that the eruption caused the destruction 
of the Minoan palaces in a work of his back in 1939. It's a classic case of looking for a single cause for a complex set of historical circumstances. Now, Minoan civilization focused on Knossos, on Crete. Uh, there were secondary palaces and other settlements on the island and elsewhere in the Aegean. Uh, as a civilization, Minoans had monumental architecture, um, the palace, huge scale uh, storage facilities for surplus food. Uh, their palaces were centers of craft production as well as of rituals. Uh, there were two phases for many of the Minoan palaces. They were rebuilt after earthquakes, we think. Uh, many of the newer palaces have uh, the same features, plus evidence for extensive trade with other parts of the Mediterranean world. Uh, they did have a writing system, one that developed from their own form of hieroglyphics. Uh, we only have translated the last and uh, most, I guess you would call the most recent form of their uh, script. And by then, you know, the Mycenaeans were busy raiding, ruling the island, so it hardly counts. So the Minoans are a bit impenetrable because we don't have the writing. Uh, the religion from the cult objects found uh, seems to include more goddesses than gods. Uh, is it matriarchal? So it's led to some rather wild and poorly supported theories about Minoan culture as a whole. This idea that it was matriarchal and peaceful and was destroyed by the Mycenaeans. Now, Arthur Evans, who discovered the great palace at Knossos, argued for the existence of a, what he called the Pax Minoica, the Minoan peace, on the ground that we see no depictions of warfare in Minoan frescoes. That's kind of thin, right? especially since other archaeologists have turned up evidence for fortifications. We admittedly have no uh, evidence of Minoan armed forces or of any conquests made by them outside of Greece, but it is a matter of continuing debate. So I promised we would talk about the late Minoan period because it has direct bearing on when we situate the uh, eruption. Uh, the late phase of the Minoan civilization is generally divided into three. Late Minoan 1a, between those dates, 1b, between those dates, and Late Minoan 2, between those dates. We know from archaeological evidence that all of the Cretan palaces except Knossos were destroyed towards the end of 1b. Knossos survived for another 50 years or thereabouts, but it was occupied by the Minoans during that time. So what took out the Minoans? Uh, conquest and earthquakes were the original explanation, but as the uh, eruption was studied and explored by scholars, the new leading theory was ash falls and additional earthquakes, as well as the tsunamis that were caused. Now, why did the opinion on this shift? More or less because uh, the 19th century was presented with a parallel example, uh, the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa, which showed people exactly how settlements could be affected by earthquakes, how crops and animals could be killed by ash, and how damaging tsunamis were. Now, Akrotiri seemed to, s to support this idea, but when they looked at Akrotiri, it became clear that it was buried by the eruption at the end of 1A, at the latest, not during 1B, when the palaces had been destroyed. So the eruption could not have destroyed the palaces unless it had lasted for 50 years, uh, or the Aegean chronology, and thus the Egyptian was entirely wrong. Now, the Minoans had also rebuilt their palaces after earlier earthquakes, so obviously something's different after the final destruction. Something prevented them from doing so. Uh, the eruption certainly could have caused ash to fall and, uh, you know, famine to happen, uh, emigration, civil disruption, but that wouldn't necessarily have toppled the palaces uh, unless, uh, you know, rioters got torch happy. Uh, the dating is problematic, still. Now, there was some archaeological evidence that shows us that even areas affected by the ash um, were continuously inhabited. Uh, there was a Minoan uh, colony on Rhodes that shows us the pumice layer below the 1B pottery layer. Now, one other potential explanation is the tsunami, which could have affected some of the coastal palaces. Uh, others, however, would have been protected. 
uh, Festos was on a 200 meter hill protected by a mountain range from which the tsunami would have hit, but it was destroyed at the same time. The most important thing to remember is that sudden events do not necessarily have sudden causes. Don't fall for the temptation of explaining away large-scale historical change with a natural disaster. It's a form of environmental determinism, and unfortunately it's coming back into style to do that amongst popular historians in particular. All right. So something as dramatic as this would have taken its place in folk memory. I found one source that estimated the sound the eruption made would have been audible as far away as Scotland. Uh, the loudest sound in the Bronze Age, basically. I gave you a link there to a, a video of an eruption of a tiny volcano uh, in Southeast Asia, just to let you compare it. We'll look at it quickly at the uh, Zoom session, if not. Now, the imp size of this eruption has actually led uh, certain popular writers, as well as some historians and archaeologists who know better, uh, to suggest that the eruption is actually the basis for the legend of Atlantis, uh, as composed by Plato. Now, this idea of historicizing a legend uh, is called euhemerism, uh, after the Greek scholar Euhemeros, who hypothesized that the gods were originally powerful kings who were turned into divinities via the process of apotheosis. This is based on what you can only call pseudo-history, uh, this idea that legend and myth are interchangeable. Now, Plato tells the story of Atlantis in his dialogue, specifically uh, Timaeus and Critias, where they narrate the story of Atlantis. Uh, Atlantis was apparently at war with the original Athens of 9,000 years ago, and unfortunately, um, Plato didn't finish the Critias, and he stopped just at the point that Zeus and the Olympians were deciding what to do with Atlantis, uh, which had uh, become an immoral civilization. Now, Plato describes it as an island just outside the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar. The island is larger than Libya and Asia combined. Uh, the, he claims it was an empire, that they had actually expanded into the western Mediterranean, but wanted more. And Athens is the one who stands up to fight them. Uh, in the end, both cities are destroyed, both Atlantis and the original version of Athens, uh, by some sort of catastrophe. And uh, Plato claims the land around the pillars, sorry, the sea around the pillars is now impassable because of the changes in the undersea terrain created by the sinking of the island. He basically depicts Atlantis as a Bronze Age civilization, uh, but could have writ large. It has colossal armies and resources, and their royal family is descended from Poseidon. Uh, but their heritage is diluted by intermarriage with mortals, and the Atlanteans become too materialistic. This leads to war as their punishment. Now, Plato's uh, version seems to be the earliest document about Atlantis that we have. Uh, later sources talk about it, but they all refer back to him. Uh, the dialogues do suggest the existence of an earlier uh, oral tradition about Atlantis. And this one is conveyed in an unusual way. So Critias, who's the dialogue, the character in the dialogues, is supposed to be Plato's great-grandfather. He heard about Atlantis from his, his grandfather, who got the story from Solon, the Greek lawgiver, who got the story from a visit to Egypt, where he was informed by Egyptian priests that natural disasters had shortened the Greeks' historical memory. Um, this has caused that memory to be uh, unnaturally truncated. And they supposedly had the story of Atlantis written on columns in one of their temples. Is this fiction? Oh, uh, absolutely. There's no reason to think it's anything but. But was it inspired by an actu actual natural disaster? Uh, hard to know. Euhemerism is a fun game as long as it stays at the level of a game. It's interesting to speculate the, uh, issue of folk memory and oral tradition is fascinating. Uh, but once you start cranking out books talking about how uh, Atlantis was there, you really have to question your own motives. Now, um, there's one other myth I would remember for you here. Uh, the Book of Exodus. Uh, this is referred to in your readings uh, for tutorial this week. So Exodus, of course, is the book of the Bible 
where Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt after the various plagues and other phenomena. Um, sometimes uh, the eruption is connected directly to Exodus, but, you know, it still doesn't work. The dating, given to the original dating of both of these events, is out by 50 years. But, you know, to be fair, some of the plagues are consistent with what you might have seen in major volcanic eruptions. So darkness in the middle of the day could be the ash cloud, swarms of insects and lightning and severe hail. Uh, ash clouds can start static electricity and lightning. And uh, the ejection of material into the atmosphere can indeed affect the weather. Now, some writers have gone further, uh, dis claiming, for instance, that the Nile River turning to blood, as well as the death of livestock and the plague of dust that caused boils and sores were all connected to the, the eruption. Because the eruption can cause red-brown discoloration of water, the death of marine life, the death of livestock due to the ash and the destruction of crops. Volcanic ash can even cause skin irritation. And of course, they call the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night the Plinian Column. Now, plausible? Eh, okay. Uh, if you accept that Exodus happened, this is another exercise in your humorism. All right, we have a fun activity to do at our actual Zoom session that will kind of tie this up neatly. Uh, but for now, uh, hope you enjoyed. We'll be back with another one soon.